Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of season two of the Broker Breakdown. Myself and Mike are super excited this morning for two reasons. One, we have a special guest on the show today. And secondly, Mike, we have hit the century mark for listens on the podcast. How do you feel about that, Mike? Oh, sorry, I was muted there, as awkward as that is. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, super excited. Um, obviously, everything everything's a process, right? Everything takes time. So really excited that we got there. And um, I think that's the hardest part of starting up anything, right, is the beginning few stages. So having those kind of lowered expectations have actually helped me not, not be upset with those things, which is awesome. Yeah, no, I'm super excited and I'm super proud of the content that we've posted so far. Um, and the support we've gotten over the past, I don't know, eight months or so, because we started this back in, what, March or April of last year, and then kind of took that big break during the summer, and then kind of went back at it. So, you know, I'm really excited and super uh, proud of kind of as, how far we've gone, the content we've posted, and again, the content to come. So, um, yeah, and then kind of going into today, uh, we have a guest on the show. Um, he's someone that I've worked with over the past two to three years now um, through a Ford dealership out in Guelph, Wellington County area. Um, I'll let him introduce himself. So Doug, welcome to the show. How's uh, how's the morning going? It is a distinct pleasure to be on the broker breakdown with you both, James, the insurance professor. And uh, I was trying to think of a a nickname to come up for with Mike. I'm going to go with mitigation Mike, because Ah, what do we have to do with that risk for clients? We mitigate it, but no. Thank you very much for having me on, and uh, yeah, it's been wonderful uh, to you know develop the uh, type of relationship that we have, James. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some some good discussions here about uh, you know whatever I can contribute in terms of yeah. uh, Ford stuff, EV stuff, general car stuff. You guys have done a tremendous job at uh, you know educating people here on the podcast. Uh, at, you know things we might think are common knowledge. Uh, aren't really that common sometimes. So no. uh, kudos to you guys and, and congratulations on the century mark for your uh, listenership and onward and thank upward you. and way to go. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, Doug, do you want to kind of introduce yourself and kind of where your background is, how you kind of fell into the um, auto industry world and yeah, just kind of take two to three minutes and kind of chat about yourself and where where you come from. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, James. Yeah, so my name's Doug Bricknell. I'm here from Wayne Pittman Ford Lincoln in the Guelph Auto Mall in Guelph, Ontario. And uh, it's our family business. So it's uh, been in the family since 1976. My great uncle, Wayne Pittman, um, founded, they purchased the dealership in 1976. And he was the first one to kind of build uh, at our location out here in Guelph, which has turned into the, the Guelph Auto Mall. And uh, it's been a, I'm happy to be a part of uh, continuing on the legacy. My father, Wayne Bricknell, is uh, now the dealer principal and uh, president of the company. So he's he's worked very hard to uh, to get to where he's at. And I'm grateful to have him as a as a mentor. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a, it's a great um, opportunity for me to come in. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can, taking it one step at a time. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we're, we're proud to be family owned and operated. Uh, more of a, a smaller, you know, locally owned uh, place that a lot of uh, the trend, I'm sure you've seen it these days in, in the auto industry is to have these large dealer groups. And, and it's, uh, it's not a negative thing. It's just a different way of doing things sometimes where it turns into a bit more of a corporate environment. Um, perhaps, you, you know, great gain economies of scale and I'm sure people have great experiences there, but some people still appreciate that kind of family feel that that sort of uh, warmth that, that you get from a, from a, uh, family store. So we're, we're happy to provide that and uh, uh, try to stay really active in the community as well and give back to the to the people that uh, that help us out. So, Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice that you guys have been family run and operated for that long because it's, again, 1976, that is a long time because, again, that's kind of how the market has gone. A lot of other people that I work with, again, they are owned by bigger corporations that own 10, 20, 100 even dealerships, right? So it's still to be family owned and operated for that long. That's kudos to you guys. And again, I've been there personally numerous times and the friendliness and helpfulness of the staff is again, something that I've 
rarely seen dealerships. So kudos to you guys. Thanks, James. That's very kind of you to say, yeah, we're, we're very blessed to, to have the people that we have. And, um, ultimately we understand that, you know, people have so many choices out there. I'm sure you guys, uh, James and Mike, you see it in the industry as well. You know, there's so many, um, insurance companies out there. There's so many brokerages out there. And so how do you differentiate yourself? You try to just treat people fairly and make them feel comfortable, make them feel welcomed. And, and, uh, hopefully that's what they remember because, you know, the truck we have on the lot here may be absolutely identical to another truck that's out there, but what makes a difference? It's the experience, how you make mm-hmm. them feel, how you treat them. And, uh, yeah. that's what we try to do. No, I, you know what, just to jump in on that, Doug, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, we're in a very similar space with respect to client experience. I feel like when you get that more of, um, um, that kind of not the mom and pop shop, but you know, the idea where it's not just the, the click and pay, whether it's on a vehicle or insurance, we had more of that, you know, that education side, the, you know, if you have those random questions, I'm kind of here for you phase as well, even if that's buying a vehicle as well, there's always going to be a class of clients that always want that or, or, or so we hope, right? So oh, yeah. it's, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, as, as different avenues become available, um, to be able to, I guess, buy vehicles in general, you know, all, how do you differentiate your value as that kind of, you know, that um, kind of still standardized kind of dealership model too, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you, you said a very important word there, Mike, which is value. I think that's a really value added thing when you take the time to explain things properly as you do on the podcast here as well, um, you know, to, to help people fully understand what they're getting into. And, Hopefully, once they understand it, they can see that, you know, this isn't just somebody trying to, uh, you know, push something on me just to get a sale. This is you're genuinely caring for their needs and and just helping them anticipate what they may need in the future. Um, Because you guys say it on here all the time. And again, big fan of the show. Um, You you never think it's going to happen to you until it does. And um, so that's it's important to to be prepared and and where you guys come in with that education element uh, saves people in the long run so i like the uh i'll let james i'll let you jump in here but i wanted one quick thing because i just remembered it that the name mitigation mike there doug i don't even <laughs> i i, I kind of like it You're because royalty free it's yours now I, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> yeah. I like it because i actually as soon as you said it i thought it's so true. Most of the stuff that I bring up when we're discussing um, coverages or recommendations or things are how can we, how can you as a client, whether it's on car insurance or home insurance, avoid having the claim? So some of the things that I, t- I always bring up are, you know, what can we do to avoid that from even happening in the first part? It might not necessarily be a discount on your insurance, which is what we'd all love to see. And I know most clients sure. love to see those things, but it's just as simple as, you know, what are things that you can do to avoid it? Just regular home and auto maintenance, right? So mm-hmm. I when you said that, I'm like, oh man, that's so true. Like I do that maybe maybe too often with respect to this is what you need to know, you know, uh to, to avoid things. So I like that. I like the name. Hey, there you go. Yeah, feel free to take it and run with it. That's that's good. <laughs> and uh yeah, to that point as well. And I mean we could take this in in whatever direction we want to, but uh there have been a few things as I've been listening uh that you've brought up. Um, you guys are so educated on things uh, you almost don't even need me on here but I'm happy to to answer any questions you may have Um, I know that a big topic you've covered supply chain really well and extensively Um, and then recently I was listening to one where you're talking about uh, rental coverage that's a big one too we can dive into that topic or we can go wherever you guys want to go so yeah my question my question actually was going to be on the supply chain of things obviously we've seen since COVID Obviously, things have changed a lot, not even just in the auto industry, but kind of many other industries that might even impact the auto industry. The biggest thing that I've kind of seen for you guys is obviously the semiconductors. That was a massive, massive talking point, not even just in the auto industry, but the electronics industry in general, where they weren't producing enough semiconductors. So, James, we lose you? Can you guys hear me okay? it just cut out for me as well, unfortunately. Oh, that's weird. I hate that's... 
is I, it might be even me as internet or whatnot, but I, I heard nah, a big okay. thing and I'm like, oh no, do we lose the guy? Yes. What was he? He was talking about the semiconductors. Was, do you want to just jump in in case he comes back here, Doug, on that? Yeah, happy happy to do that. And then, you know, once he gets back online, we can take it from there. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, James. Yeah, the semiconductors were obviously a big, very newsworthy uh, piece of the puzzle, no pun intended, because they are pieces in a vehicle. But um, And then it's turned into a whole... Um, domino effect of different things if it's not chips it's other parts if it's not parts it's labor in the factories Um, if it's not labor it's transportation uh, trying to ship the vehicles uh, nationally internationally Um, it's just so many links in the chain um, that can sometimes be impacted and it's 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 not always just one thing causing it but there always seems to be something these days Uh, but thankfully you know but consumers have been understanding for the most part. I mean, you know, nobody likes to have to wait longer than they, they need to for their vehicle. And, and, you know, our approach is to be as transparent as possible. It may seem sort of silly or perhaps be viewed as unprofessional, but it's just the honest truth. Sometimes we don't know when a vehicle is going to arrive. Like we have an ETA, but that ETA may as well be, a, you know, like throwing a dart onto a dartboard. Sometimes, uh, things arrive on time and and you're very grateful for that. Other times, you know, you need to allow for those unforeseen things where, you know, things were really jammed up at the shipping docks and okay. So we needed to wait a little longer for the vehicle or or it's being held for chips or it's being held for some other part that they're waiting for. Um, Again, not ideal circumstances, but thankfully we're trying to make sure people are comfortable with their buying process. Um, The way we do it here with refundable deposits until your vehicle arrives, you're not really on the hook for anything other than your time. Um, And then once the vehicle arrives, obviously you have the the first right of refusal. And if you want it, great, lovely. We would appreciate that. But if not, no problem, because, uh, you know, we can can hopefully find another home for it and uh, you don't lose your deposit or anything. Um, So we're trying to find ways to keep it really... um, very low to no barriers to entry into the market for folks these days because it's hard enough as it is with a, you know um their interest rates being what they are and affordability yes. in general yep. out there so try to keep it as you know uh, as stress stress low stress it's never nothing's ever stress free but try to keep it as low stress as possible what was the the one thing i wanted to touch on there cuz there's a lot of a lot of decent decent points the the first rate of refusal there with respect to like how it affects cars and purchasing i know i think i have an understanding on that but for any viewers that maybe are not is that can you quickly explain that doug yeah so we have to um when we submit a a vehicle order uh we have to have a lot more information documented now initially in the early days um this is not a game that we played but you know there were some um folks out there who were just submitting kind of phantom orders in it as a background way or a backdoor way to get stock right Um, nowadays it's it's very um regulated and that's for the better of the industry because this way it's it's fair and equitable uh we have to submit uh certain information like a a, you know signed bill of sale and things like that to submit the order um but as i mentioned you know no no money actually really changes hands for good until the vehicle arrives and the customer sees it drives it uh experiences it again um, maybe, you know, sometimes we don't have every paint color in stock. So maybe they go, oh, you know what? That looks a little different. Or, um, you know what? We, our needs have changed. Uh, things happen. So in the event that folks do need to change their plans, um, you just basically sign a letter of, of release and then we can look to another buyer for, for that vehicle. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, and for the most part, though, people are excited. It's kind of like, uh, you know, when your package arrives from the mail and it, you're, you're or, you know, Christmas morning or something like that, if you celebrate it, where you, you're excited to, to unwrap this new thing that you've been anticipating and, and waiting for. So, yeah, um, it, but it's nice to have options here. You're, you're never handcuffed to it, um, at least here at our at our place. That's the way we like to do things. So, um, right. yeah, that's that's kind of a way to, to decrease those uh, that sort of maybe anxiety related to buying a product that you haven't physically touched seen um you know because uh, it's not like the how it used to be even a couple of years ago exactly well and that's the point right too is that <clears throat> there was a time where i remember even my elantra that i bought back in 2013 you know you go over right. the lot there's there's literally a hundred other elantras in different colors 
Uh, the financing terms are far different than they were right now with just just interest rates in general. And you know you had a little bit more sway with the dealerships as well, right? Because it was a little a different different buying process uh, process for sure. But I, I I know COVID and the supply chain, man, has it made it um, kind of more of like that. You know, buy it, buy it now, or we don't, you know, we, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, and maybe you won't get it for a year. So I get your point, right? It's exciting once that time comes to actually be able to pick it up. But it's good to know that if plans change, because you know the world is ever changing for us as consumers. That you know, as your family maybe can't purchase it moving forward, or something's happened financially in the last year. I guess what they it just it goes back to the dealership, and you guys can kind of get it to the next person in line. Is that how that works? Yeah, exactly right, Mike. We uh, we would take it in for stock at that point, and usually, um, especially nowadays, we you know all of our uh, sales consultants will have a list of folks who they're looking for this type of vehicle, and perhaps they've got one on order, and maybe they, you know, their needs are more urgent, so they'll right. they'll take the one that's here now, and then um, you know surrender their their other one, and and then it comes in for stock later. So it's yeah, it is nice to have those options, and and something you touched on as well previously on the podcast. It's it's um, a nice windfall for us to have that stock unit because some customers don't have the luxury of, of months and months. If you're in an accident and your vehicle's written off, you need something today or tomorrow yes. because yes. you need to get to work. You need to get your family to school or whatever it may be. Um, so it is, uh, yeah, thankfully the inventory situation is improving a little bit. We're seeing slight improvements, you know, our I'm, like like many people, our lot was down to you know single digits at one point, which is right. absolutely you know never been seen before. It's just, usually, we'd carry we're in Guelph, our market area. We would carry maybe 125 to 150 units of stock in in traditional days. Sure. Um, so still quite quite a quite a lot of units, but yeah, to go down to like having two or three, uh, and that's total not. It, it, that's exclude. This would be new vehicles. Uh, pre-owned is is you know has been a little more um, steady because it's it's trade-ins that come in that we yeah. uh, uh, safety and recondition and, and sell as, as pre-owned vehicles. But um, yeah, for new stock, it, there were some uh, some really dark days. There were people you know there wasn't anything that people could even tangibly drive before yeah. they purchased or submitted their order. But now it's starting to improve a little more. It's nice to have something that people can experience before they place their order. Um, but uh, it's still a long way to go. Uh, oh, still okay. not sure. nowhere close to pre-pandemic levels. But I think that it's a uh, it's been a, an interesting shift for the industry to go to more of a, uh, a pull system rather than a push system. And I think a lot of consumers appreciate that actually, because they're more in the driver's seat, excuse the pun, um, because they get to you know dictate their terms. This is what I want. This is what I need. Um, this is what's best for my family, my my business, whatever it may be. Instead of, oh, you've got this. Maybe I don't need those features, but you've got it, so I'm going to take it. So hopefully, we see that trend continue, where folks can get the you know tailored fit to their needs, um, and yes. they'll have a better experience. Hopefully. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. James, we got you back now as well. Yeah, we got me back. If anything can, <laughs> any more things can go wrong today. The internet goes down for like a second. The dog starts barking. Like oh, it's no. just <laughs> everything is going wrong today. But we're back. That's what happens when you record a show. I guess is that really anything can happen. But uh, I guess the show goes on, right? You guys kept going, but um, yeah, actually, we touched one... base on the on the chip stuff. But I know cool. if you have other, I know you got other stuff lined up for uh, for Doug as well. Yeah, the one thing that me and Doug did talk about last time I was with him was um, something that Ford actually was doing, which was the price freezing or the interest freezing that you guys were doing. Is that still something that you guys are continuing or is that just kind of like a thing like during like the Christmas time and then now it's kind of you guys aren't doing that anymore? Good, uh, yeah, good, good point there, James. Good question. Yeah, we call it an incentive protection. So it's it's the opportunity to protect your, um, you know, there aren't as many necessarily incentives air quotes these days where there are huge delivery allowances or you know certain units occasionally those incentives do pop up but it's more so about yeah you lock in your order and you lock in your rate and then as you you explained it really well James uh, on the on the previous show where uh, you do get the choice of either the programs and programs refers to interest rate um, payment terms um, delivery allowance things like that you get the choice of the programs at the time of order. So say the rate is, and again, they've gone up uh, 
uh, as everything has recently. Uh, but say your rate right now is 5.49. And then six months down the road, the rate changes to 6.29. You can still fall back on that that 549 that you had at, at time of order. So that's called an incentive protection. It's important to, if you're purchasing a vehicle, please ask your dealer about it. And I'm not sure if it's, the, it's something that every manufacturer does. I know Ford has, has been really, um, you know, pushing that and encouraging that because it just makes sense for everybody. Uh, you know, it, it helps to avoid those, those surprises uh, down the line when the vehicle comes in. What do you mean it went from, you know, X amount to X amount? That's crazy. Um, we want people to have a good experience and, and be able to budget their lives properly. So yeah, incentive protection has been a great way to sort of help people feel more comfortable about the order process. No, that's really, that's really good because I, I, I believe that just from doing some research myself, I'm pretty sure you guys are the only ones that offer some sort of protection oh, like that. So it's, there you go. <laughs> again, in the day that we live in with everything increasing inflation, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's nice to see that companies are actually taking the steps and measures required to basically help people and not just, I, mean, I wouldn't really want to say blindside, but again, it's when you have a, a handshake and sign paperwork at 1% and then it goes up, even if it goes up half a percent, it's still on a vehicle that could be worth 50, 60, $70,000. You're talking a few, at least a few thousand dollars right there. Right. So, oh, yeah. And it's a big dissatisfier too. I mean, who, who would, classify that as a good experience nobody right so we want people to have that positive experience and and that incentive protection has been huge and yeah thankfully ford has been you know people think these these larger corporations are you know heartless and uh, greedy but no they really there have been there's been a big focus in recent years to uh focus on the more human elements of things um you know especially in the early days of covid too they had a, a built to lend a hand program um and during different natural disasters as well, Ford has really um, been proactive about, hey, how can we make this easier for people to weather the storm? Um, is it, you know, helping them defer some payments and, and you know, not charge penalties for that? Or, you know, they're always trying to find ways to to, to make the customer experience better and, and, and have it be a more human interaction. No, that's good. Yeah. It's, it's very... Very good to hear that a company actually is caring about their clients and it's not just the process of purchasing. And then after that, you're kind of on your own and fend for yourself kind of mentality. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I know we we had kind of briefly mentioned it earlier on in the pod too. Um, when it comes to on the other side of that, you know, we we're talking about vehicle prices and things. And, and this is something I think it'd be, it'd be fun to talk about as well as, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of stories and heard a lot of stories of uh, rental coverage. And I just wanted to reiterate to folks how important it is to make sure you have appropriate uh, vehicle rental coverage. Uh, if, if, you know, from the broker perspective and then also from the dealer perspective, um, please talk to your, talk to Mike and James about these things um, because it can really save you long term as much as, you know, you may think, you know, a couple, couple days, a week or two is enough. We see it all the time here now where it's taking a lot longer to get body work done if you have an accident. Um, so, yeah, talk to talk to the, the fellas oh, here about to make sure so you have the right rental coverage. It's so I would true. I would say I would suggest that in the given landscape we're at right now, um, just with the supply chain issues in general, part problems, mm -hmm. um, I mean, overall costs, right, just inflationary costs, I mean mm – -hmm. There, most policies for a long period of time, James, too, they, they had around $1,500, right, of rental vehicle. Yeah, I've even I mean, seen nowadays, some as low as 800 Right, right. In a landscape that we live in right now, where maybe the average claim is three to four weeks, it's not one to two by any means. You're probably looking at increasing that to $2,500 on your policy, if not 3000 I think is a good, those are two good spots. Some mm -hmm. people go more depending on how long, but like, like you mentioned earlier, Doug, it, if you have like let's say a new vehicle and unfortunately it is written off in a claim, which you know does happen, and we don't want to talk about it, but it does. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, getting that same make model year, you know, back for you within what three to four weeks, like that's got to be almost unless it's just sitting there in stock waiting for you. You know, that that's got to be super hard, right, for you guys Stars too. Would really have to align to, to right. make that happen. So yeah. Uh, 
exactly all the more reason to have that uh, that rental coverage in in place uh, to help kind of bridge the gap between the the, the time that you get your new unit and the time that you've you've had the claim. Um, and same with uh, again, not to not to dive back on it too much, but the the bodywork element. Uh, we have some you know obviously a good network of of uh, friends who are in the the auto body industry and including CSN Golden Triangle here in Guelph, do a lot of business with them. Um, and what they're experiencing too, it's not just parts availability, it's labor too, trying to find people who want to get into um, that business. Yes. We see it on our own end um, with uh, skilled labor, technicians, uh, front end staff, everything. So it, it may not just be, it's not them trying to be difficult. So please be understanding too, people out there. If, if it takes a little longer, please be understanding that they, a lot of people there are showing up and trying their best but uh, you know we can only give a hundred percent and uh, you can't can't go beyond that so um but yeah and all the more reason to to give yourself that that extra cushion of having a bit more rental coverage it's uh it's not a bad thing for the for the small small uh, cost to it it's a big benefit so james so, I, got, I got one question i wanted to ask doug before i forget and then yep. i'll let you ask yours because it, and it only has to be two minutes um with with financing and the way things are going with interest rates now, Doug, too, mm-hmm. I know that some dealers, um, the, 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 and correct me on the language if I'm saying it wrong, like the gap coverage for like the financing difference mm-hmm. is, so we have it in the insurance industry, we have something called waiver of depreciation, which is very similar to that on the insurance side is I think it could be on yours on maybe the, the difference on what you're financing versus what you'll get back if there's a claim, right, or, or something along those lines, um, is is that something that's offered? Like, is that something that because we have it for basically, let's say you buy that brand new Ford, and the insurance company, you know, a month later and there's a claim and they say, hey, you know, and we know you paid fifty for it. We think the the market value now is is you know forty, so you're you're not you're out that ten grand. If there's a coverage that we sell, which is new vehicle replacement waiver depreciation. It's it's kind of just anything. For, it's it, the same coverage for any new vehicle that we'd put for somebody, but it kind of bridges that gap so that the insurance company doesn't give the wrong payout amount in the event of a claim. Are are there are there like options at the dealership for that as well from the financing side? Uh, yes, Mike. Yeah, of course. And I'm, I'm just pulling up uh, some notes on this here as well because I want to make sure I'm giving the the most accurate information, but uh, yeah. yes, four, it doesn't, it doesn't got to be very specific. It's more <laughs> or less just the generalization. Cause I've, I, I, maybe I, I remember when I bought my Elantra a while back, uh, I forget the terminology behind it, but it was, it was basically if something happens to the vehicle, it kind of continues on those payments. But this, now this was when I bought it, like literally 10 years ago at this point. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of options. Ford does have Ford Credit does have their own proprietary uh, gap coverage. So in the event of of you know that uh, the vehicle is stolen, unrecoverable, total loss, um, what this does it's it's uh, basically like a um, if I understand it correctly, you know, a debt forgiveness program to help so that you're not in previous episodes you discussed. Um, rolling in a bunch of negative equity into your next vehicle purchase. Yes, this, right, this helps right. um, mitigate that so that you're not having to be stuck on on the on the line for, you know, could be a, a pretty significant amount. And uh, it, Ford, uh, yeah, Ford Credit does have their own proprietary one. There are some other third party um, providers out there that that do provide a similar product. Um, you'll hear it referred to as as Gap most often. So. Um, yeah, you're 100 percent right. right, Mike. There, and uh, all the more important these days, especially when when perhaps values and on especially um, pre-owned units sometimes is, has been more inflated um, than than other times. So there right. may be a bit more um, of a gap there than there would be previously. Right? Um, we've seen it go the other way, where it's like you discussed, there was a time there when the vehicle value actually went up, but now we've seen a, a market correction where um, you know, thanks to thanks to interest rates, things are, are cooling and, and sort of coming back down to earth. But yeah, gap is another great way to to protect yourself against that uh, that risk there. And and uh, yeah, while we're at it too, I mean, hey, let's let's talk about some other things in 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 terms of protecting your vehicle as well. Um, we talk about inflation and uh, you know finding ways to to, to combat it. 
and uh, two things that are are very common. I think there are a lot of this is something you guys probably encounter as well. There's sometimes a lot of misconceptions in the industry, perhaps some some outdated uh, you know stigmas around the industry about certain things, certain products. I don't believe in that. That's just a bunch of fairy dust, hocus pocus, you know, right. sort of things. Right? How many yeah. times you? I've never had it. I've had it. You know, been driving for forty years, or I've owned my home for. You know, 40 years i've never needed it well yes things oh things trust me changed. we get that all the time yeah. on the insurance side <laughs> yeah yeah it never I happened can, to me so it's not going to happen ever again right i can imagine right that and, kind and of stance on things all due respect to 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 those folks there but yeah sometimes it's worth sort of taking time to hear about these things like um one that's been really big for us is is prepaid maintenance and uh it's a great way to hedge against inflation because you're basically purchasing a like a punch card for X amount of services and you're paying today's prices for them and you're going to use them into, you know, 23, 24, 25. Um, mm. And so you're basically locking in at today's rates because on average, the cost of, of even an oil change goes up to, depending on, you know, oil prices, things like that. But five to 7% a year on average would be the, the standard, you know, benchmark for, inflation on a on an oil change say right and, and by purchasing that plan today you may think okay it's a bit of an upfront cost but if you're going to do it anyways it's a great way to kind of hedge hedge against inflation a dollar today versus a dollar tomorrow um yeah that's that's one product that really helps and then the other one is uh, is extended warranty too i mean we all like to think everything would be covered all the time forever uh but then we'd have a lot of you know yeah, manufacturers go bankrupt. <laughs> so it is a nice way to, again, just you, you hope you never need to use it. Um, but especially with all the technology and vehicles these days, modules, um, even like headlamps, things like that. There's there's so many, so many expensive parts in a vehicle. Um, that's another great way to hedge against inflation and enter segue into EVs and cost of vehicle ownership. Maybe this is a good time to introduce that topic, fellas. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, no, I actually, uh, before we kind of get into that, I want to okay. make more of a, like a statement and then we I definitely want to get into EVs because yeah. I know when me and Doug talked uh, in November, it was a big topic, but um, funny thing you said about um, the like collision shops is that again, I know I talk about it all the time, but my girlfriend's family, they own a collision shop in, Br- oh, in Brampton. I didn't and, know that. Oh, there yes. we go. Very neat. <laughs> And up, same I mean, the same name? thing, CSN Colex in Brampton. Oh, there you go. And they're finding the same issue is that like they cannot find qualified people to come in. And it's almost like a dying industry because no one wants to get – no young people want to get into that industry anymore. There's no one going to school for to be a mechanic, like a body repairer, a painter, um, mm-hmm. anything like that, right? So they're finding the same issues is that no one wants to get into that industry and the lack of – workforce behind it is a huge problem for them so i just kind of wanted to make that statement and because again it's it's i think it's it's not only just them but it's a lot of industries like you even saw during uh right when during covid hit in the insurance industry had that issue where a lot of companies were super understaffed they laid people off or whatever it was and Mm -hmm. even like the underwriters the claims departments like billing they just didn't have enough people because people just weren't getting into this industry right so um, yeah. but yeah, it's the auto body, auto body is really yeah. bad right now. Like a lot, like I don't, if you look at any kind of statistics, like you can just see it just, it's plummeting. Like the amount of people that are in that industry, like how many times you drive down like a, like a small town or whatever. And you see like shops just close like left, right and center. And like the buildings are just dilapidated and just falling apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm hoping for, um, you know, as it with great, uh, you know, with these sort of these gaps uh, come great opportunity. You know, if, if folks are looking to get into a, a good trade, if, you know, good, stable, well-paying job, there's obviously a lot of demand for it. Hey, there's a great opportunity to, to get involved. And, you know, there's a lot of great college programs uh, in the area to, to get into the industry. But, yeah, you're right. And I think that uh, sometimes people think, oh, you know, excuses, excuses. How could it possibly take a month? Um it's that you've, you've you've nailed it there james that's why because it's, it's hard to find people as much as you may try you try to increase wages you try to increase benefits you try to attract people and it's still a, an uphill battle but we'll keep trying it's, it's we, we shouldn't let up yeah we had a meeting me and mike literally yesterday with a comp with an insurance company and they said the two biggest things that they have problems with 
well, that brokers have problems with that they've relayed to them is one, finding clients and two, finding people to hire. So yeah. it's it's a very common element to a lot of businesses where they just know if you go anywhere, like look at Tim Hortons, how many Tim Hortons do you go to on a daily basis, especially in Guelph? Cause I see it all the time um, that they're mm-hmm. like hiring help. And yes. even, even so like so there's some Tim Hortons, even, even, even McDonald's I've seen that they're hiring at like 20, $22 an hour because they mm-hmm. just can't get people in anymore. Right. Yep, exactly. And, and retention to getting them in is, is, is a is challenge. One thing. And then, and Keeping then retention, them. retention is, uh, is so important. So yeah, that's something that internally we as a company here at Pittman Ford Lincoln have been trying to work on as well. And, you know, having those open discussions, what can we try to do? This is something I'm a big advocate for is like, Hey, how can we make things better here for you? You know, what can we do to make it more efficient, more comfortable? What are your needs? And then let's, let's work on it together. Um, so hopefully we can keep that culture going and, and, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's, what's really going to make the difference is, is, uh, is retention. It's expensive and, and difficult to find people. <laughs> it, it really is. And again, yeah. when you spend all that money, you don't want them walking out the door in three months, six months. Yeah. Cause then all basically you just, all exactly, you just pay to train them and then they've walked out the door and they've taken all that training and they've gone to like either a competitor or they've gone somewhere else. Right. So mm-hmm. very, very important, but yeah. What's Moving that? on to my favorite topic of today, and I know Ooh. Doug, <laughs> I know Doug has been just dying to get to this topic, but <laughs> electric vehicles, you've seen in the news, basically every manufacturer has started moving into electric vehicles. The Canadian government has basically put restrictions on how many gas vehicles can be sold up to 2025, 2030, 2035, all that kind of stuff, basically moving all into electric. Um, obviously, Ford probably being, other than Tesla, probably being the biggest company moving into electric vehicles. You had the Mach-E, basically, that came out right away. You have the Ford F-150 Lightning now. Um, I know has the, there's been talks about doing like an actual Mustang as well, electric, hasn't there? Um, I think that Ford's really evaluating their their whole lineup, top to bottom, to move towards uh, ZEVs, Z EVs, um, because they're zero emission vehicles. So yeah, for Ford, they're very bullish, or uh, yeah, very bullish on uh, on electric electrification. They've been huge uh, proponents of it, been very proactive about it, and uh, kind of you know trailblazers, industry leaders, have however, however you want to say it. They've they've been really pouring a lot of R and D into, into electrification and making it work for all different segments of the market. So yeah, something like with, if somebody wants a performance, the Mach-E is, is performs still performs like a Mustang, but you've got, it's all electric. So you, you, but trust me, it still flies. And then, uh, so yeah, I think they're, they're really reevaluating the whole, the whole family to, to hit the, try to hit those targets of, like you said, James, uh, you know, the government of Canada uh, has a target date for 2035 as the end of sale for what you'll see abbreviated as, as ICE vehicles, I-C-E, which stands for internal combustion engine, and trying to move everybody to uh, ZEV vehicles, zero emission. So it's it's everything from fully electric vehicles to uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles count as ZEVs because they have an all-electric driving mode. It's not the same range as a full battery electric vehicle. It still has the gas to, to fall back on. Um, and then hydrogen fuel cells are another one as well that um, you see certain companies are are uh, kind of diversifying their portfolio. And hydrogen is another, um, another you know, uh, energy source uh, that's really growing in popularity as well. And there's a lot of science being um, and research and development being done to try to make that a part of the equation as well. But, but yeah, I'm grateful to work for a company like, like Ford and, and Lincoln that uh, have a strong commitment to EVs. Yeah. Cause I, I think the thing that me and Mike have talked about kind of outside the podcast is kind of how that changes, not only the market, but how that changes the insurance industry. Because mm-hmm. me and Mike were talking about it yesterday and I, I kind of posed the question to him saying, will this end up changing how insurance companies rate for electric vehicles or even like for example hydrogen because hydrogen is very is flammable is very flammable element isn't it you're right james yeah very combustible so that's where a lot of the research is going to help exactly. me safely store it supply it um if you have a 
at, you know, at, at some kind of admissions leak or, at the, you know, a leak uh, at some point. It could be potentially very hazardous, but not that I don't want to do any fear mongering here. You know, there are a lot of really safe applications of it as well, but it is something to consider. And I know another one that you've mentioned as well, James, on the podcast is um, charging and uh, people who are installing chargers at their homes. Um, do they have the the infrastructure at their home or place of work um, to handle all of this charging? And, um, you know, it's something to really be mindful of when you're, uh, say, you're in, installing a, a charging station, you know, make sure that you're using a registered licensed electrician who uh, hopefully has some experience there. There are lists out there uh, that the, the manufacturer provides of uh, recommended and approved uh, electricians who have uh, been specially trained to install these these charging units because they're they're not just a you know a toaster or something it's this is a big appliance um, with a lot of power so you want to make sure that's installed safely and as it relates to insurance you know yeah maybe it is something that uh, starts being asked on on home coverage right do you have an electric vehicle charger because you never want to have to think about it but hopefully you know fire hazard things like that just making sure everybody's uh, safe and aware of, of what's going on yeah no that's what literally i think me and mike had this conversation i think yesterday that i think that's kind of where the direction that's got to go and mike again like correct me if i'm wrong but it's again there's if there's more of a risk if there's more like if the charging stations are in homes that's a fire hazard if you plug the car in and something happens that's a that's a hazard right mm-hmm. um if you don't have the right amount of electrical ampage in your home that can short circuit cause fires all that kind of stuff that's a bigger risk. So I do think down the road, I think insurance companies, that will probably be a question that is asked almost like instantly. Do you have a charging port at your home for your vehicle? Mm -hmm. And I think insurance companies will start like asking that question to make sure that their uh, mitigation mic on the policies. (laughs) (laughs) We should get some teeth made or something or some some marketing materials for, for Mike there. I was waiting for my time to jump in there, but no, you know what? I was just I was doing research earlier uh, yesterday, just on getting a better idea about how, you know, what what the what the power of them are, and what people should be looking at. I mean, in general, if you're doing any um, home rental work that's like you know diesel electrical, you got to get a proper electrician anyways, or someone that's ESA approved to come in to do it. Because from my research, um, it has the same type of kind of voltage power of that of like a stove or a laundry machine so like when it's on it probably should be on its own dedicated breaker right for sure by itself right. you shouldn't be loading this up like other people do make you wouldn't be want to have an entire line running from your house that's got you know you got you got like you know, stove 10, fridge right you guys well or anything, anything else right like you have like a charge. fireplace and you <laughs> yeah. got four other outlets on it and you're you're taking from that line and then going over to this i mean it should have its own dedicated line for sure but that's the mitigation side because, you know, there's always going to be folks that want to do it, um, whatever's the easiest line just to pull up and in cheapest. the garage, right? Um, but the other side of that too is, you know, do insurance companies start asking questions on that? I mean, I don't know if that becomes a question until it's much further down the line. And the reason I say that is because currently, you know, we talk about electrical very briefly with home insurance, but there's not nobody ever questions washer dryer. You know, the these high load mm. um, appliances, anyways. Some insurance companies do would like to know about you know pools and hot tubs, just because again you're you're talking about you know ec- extra you know two hundred maybe two hundred amp services and stuff like that. Or, or if you have a pilot light, if it's natural gas or something, right? I guess yeah, yeah. Like there there are pieces, but the average plug and stuff isn't necessarily you know, a question that home insurance really cares about at the, at this point anyways. And it might, I don't think it probably will be moving forward. So I think like many other appliances in your home, it'll just be, you know, if you're going to have one of these, make sure it's done by a licensed electrician or, you know, an, an ESA approved electrician, not just someone that's putting it in because if there was a loss, do you want to have a fire sort of thing, right? Or is that, is that load going to cause problems? So here's my question then. Will it take, and again, this is a very like kind of almost like a morbid question, but will it take a claim for a electric charger for the insurance company to finally go, you know what, we should probably be asking this question because if there's no claim, 
like there's really no risk to it. But if insurance companies start seeing claims behind this, do you see them being like, okay, like we've seen a few of these now in the market. We should probably be asking these questions if people have electric chargers and if they're installed properly then? It's, I think it's always based on the claim data. Like what's the severity? How often do they happen? It's the things that need to make sense to the insurance companies to then, you know, cause they got to put resources. So people basically, um, adjusting the claims, finding the research, taking the calls, all that costs money. So it, it's got to be a thing that uh, impacts their business enough where it makes sense. Because to be honest, James, how, nobody nobody talks about that same conversation with um, stoves, washers, dryers, anything, any other big, no. big load, you know, appliances throughout the house. It's just not a conversation. No, um, no. Even if you're, even if you got like, you know, like natural gas stove, we assume with the guy that's doing the gas fitting is is just you know licensed insured. It's got all those. Th- There's a lot of assumptions, so I would assume that's the same way. I, I I don't I don't see it becoming a a massive thing. But then again, that's just an opinion right now, right? Maybe give, give it two years or five years or whatever happens in our industry with um, EVs as they become more of a household item and not a smaller percentage of people driving them to maybe have more data on those those topics. Yeah. And I, I, I think you're right there, Mike. And I hope you're right too, that, uh, you know, we don't want to create, uh, any, you know, dis- mistrust or, or fear about these there. Obviously I have a lot of faith in the intelligent engineers who are designing these things, you know, they, they've vetted them thoroughly. Um, so that, yeah, the frequency with which that would happen is, you know, uh, crazy things can happen, but I don't, hopefully it, it doesn't and hopefully it's not happening often enough for it to even really uh, make a big ripple in the in the industry so hopefully it's nice and safe for everybody and it's just kind of like you said a routine appliance yeah, yeah. that's right it yeah. shouldn't even be a conversation if it is maybe there's other behind the scenes stuff that often be talked about from you <laughs> yeah. know people that are higher up in positions than we are yeah sure well yeah. it's just and- it's just like gas though like gas obviously super flammable like it's not like you just wake up and like you're just putting gas in your car and it's like, there's no risk to that. Like, obviously like if you're like, that's why they banned smoking at gas stations years and yeah. years and years ago. <laughs> Cause it's so flammable. Even now you yes. go to any gas station and they have like, don't use your like cell phone by the gas station. Because again, if the battery short circuits and causes like sparks and stuff, it light, lights the whole gas station on fire and explodes. Okay. Right. So yeah. it's not like there's no risk to the gas vehicles either, but it just, again, the unknown and a lot of, like Something consumers, we're more exactly consumers mm-hmm. don't know yet electric vehicles they don't know the risk to it and again a lot of people might just be like that might be their thing they might just be like you know what i don't like this because this could possibly happen but they don't actually look at something that they're so used to with gas that there might actually be a bigger risk with gas vehicles causing fires and you see it all the time mm-hmm. like how many times like a week do you see like on the news like oh like a car fire on the 403 or the 401 QEW it happens all the time so yeah, too many times but uh, yeah that's that's actually that's a great transition point there James as well to talking talking about you know dispelling these myths or maybe easing some some uh, anxiety out there in the market for for consumers about EVs because they're kind of these these unknown or or very new items in the in the industry if you think of long term you know a lot of people this was you know if you told people years ago that they'd have all electric vehicles they'd think it was something from a you know a cartoon or a movie like that's ah, impossible you know but now it's very much a reality and with that comes that educational part of trying to encourage people to 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 learn more about them and and the more you learn about them you realize that they're they're not as scary as you may think you know range range anxiety is something we deal with uh, on a daily basis folks who believe in in electric vehicles and are excited about them but have uh concerns around is it going to have enough range to get me where i need to go and right. uh, charging takes too long or something but perhaps they're they're not as as aware of the ways these things are improving and yeah is, is it perfect no is it going to work is it a one size fits all um solution no that's why i think we'll still see we'll never see like a I, well, I don't think, and maybe this could reflect poorly in a couple of years, but I don't think we'll see a fully 100% electric vehicle future because for certain market areas, you think of out west in the prairies, long haul driving, um, it may not be a, a feasible solution. But for a lot of folks, yeah. you know, on the, the day-to-day commuter basis, I was looking at some stats, like the average commuter 
uh, this is even pre-COVID. Uh, now a lot of people, a lot more people are working from home, but the average commute is 40 to 50 kilometers. Um, you know, most electric vehicles now, like if you think of the Mach-E, you're getting 475 uh, kilometers on a full charge. Um, uh, wow. Lightning is, is even more uh, than that. And and so it's it's quite substantial. And if you think about it, like your gas tank too, I mean, that has a range as well. We just don't talk about it because it's gas. Very uh, true. I mean. Yes, very true. So it's true. just kind of easing that it's changing the perspective a little bit on, on EVs and um and feel free to interject at any time here fellas i I feel bad i don't want to do too much talking but i i just have so much excitement around this (laughs) this topic and uh try to impart some 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 you know helpful tips to to folks out there so yeah um, you know what we don't that's a great point is we don't talk about that everyone talks about all electric vehicle only gets me 500 kilometers 450 kilometers all that kind of stuff and we and we don't yeah we don't talk (laughs) about the gas tank does the same thing yeah, All you have to do true. is just go to the – I think what a lot of people actually have a problem with is going to the gas tank. It takes two minutes to fill up compared to, like, right. charging your vehicle and sitting there. A lot of people true. see, well, that's wasted time. Like, I could just go to the gas station, fill up, and be gone. Um, so I think that's kind of the misconception. But, again, like, we don't talk about that. Gas has an expiry date, too. Like, you can only drive <laughs> X amount of kilometers on a tank of gas before you have to refill. But I think it's the convenience of refilling in two minutes compared to – like for example, I think Tesla's like thirty minutes on a full charge or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. I think and the technology is improving constantly yeah, as well. Technology right? is it's, always it's, gonna improve. Like yeah. you're never gonna you're never gonna see range be five hundred kilometers or whatever it is forever. Like obviously as technology in the years go on and more people are doing this, you'll see range will go from five five fifty, six and go and higher and higher and higher as our technology grows. But right. And EVs, charging will become more efficient too. Exactly. A, EVs are so brand. young in their production that like mm-hmm. it, it had like look at iPhone. Look at where iPhone started. Yeah. And yeah, then exactly. now how many years we've had iPhone and look at the the techno technological advances they've made to not only advance the iPhone, but advance other technologies that they've had. The iPads come from that, the Macs come from that, all those kind of things, right? So yeah, it's exactly it's it's a process, not like me and Mike say nothing happens overnight. Um, there's a Very process true. to everything. And again, EVs are going to have to go through that process. But, you know, like we'll release this and then maybe in five years we'll improve this. And then again, if it, if it gets to the point where, you know what, like they can, we might get to the point where you can go a thousand kilometers on, on a charge. Who knows? But again, that's the only time we'll tell and how technology kind of advances over time. Yeah, exactly, James. And and the other thing is too, like you talk about oh, range and, you know, how often are you doing that thousand kilometer trip without a stop? You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and I, yeah, the analogy I try to draw to, for people as well with, with the discussions around ranges, think of, uh, you know, your earliest computers that you had, or perhaps, you know, um, I think we're all around the same age range here. You might remember floppy disks and yeah. <laughs> then you got your first USB stick that had a whole gigabyte that was like endless storage at the time. It was incredible. How does all that fit on one little USB? Now we've got terabyte drives and things like that that are just, um, uh, you know, exponentially better. Um, Perfect I don't know point. if it'll see that same trajectory for for charging and batteries, but we have to allow time for those improvements to be made. And there's always constantly uh, research and development going into making it um, better for consumers in, in that regard. Um so yeah, hopefully we'll we'll see that improve. Yeah, and then even, another element is uh, cost of ownership as well, which I feel like would relate to insurance as well, um, because that way, you know, people are probably wondering, okay, bottom line after vehicle purchase, financing, insurance, um, what is my monthly car expense going to be? Um, is this something you want to get into? Maybe I, we could hit on some quick. Quick stats. Yeah, we'll kind of end it off with that quickly. Yeah. Um, no, we're, we're mindful, be mindful of your time. We could go for hours. I'm sure. oh, we we definitely could. We definitely yeah. could. But yeah, we'll end it off kind of there and, and kind of say, yeah, I think with with EVs becoming more and more popular, I know some companies right now, Mike, um, they do some companies do offer like an electric vehicle discount. Um, it's not many companies, but there are some companies in the market that do that. Um, and I do think obviously over time, once electric vehicles become more of a mainstream kind of product that a lot of clients have, I think a lot of companies will 
move away from that. But I do know that some in the market do currently offer that discount. What that discount is, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But again, there are incentives, obviously, of driving an electric vehicle, not only from the gas side and saving on there and, and doing electric, but there are obviously insurance incentives as well. Yeah. I mean, very quickly, there it arranges. Every company is a little bit different. I've seen anywhere from 5 to 10%, depending on the insurance provider. I was going to say the same thing. And, and even that, there were some, there were more actually a few years back when it first became a thing. Um, I think it's actually dropped off even a little bit. I've seen kind of less and less of those discounts. But then again, with that being said, there's also less and less opportunities that I have with EVs. So um, I think it, maybe when it comes, becomes more common that it's, you know, when we, when we see more EVs on the road from different brands, you might see more quote opportunities come through and the companies kind of provide incentives if that's the way they're heading as an insurance company as well, right? I, I certainly wouldn't... Same thing with winter tires. I've always said it. I, w- I would never tell someone, hey, if you don't believe in winter tires, go buy them because you'll save all the money back on your insurance. That is that is not going to be the case. <laughs> you're you're going to save, you know, maybe 2 to 5%. That's, you know, let's just say... Twenty to fifty dollars a year. That's not going to cover the cost of winter tires. So if you're thinking I'm going to buy one because of that, that's <laughs> that's on you. But yeah, um, yeah the the discounts are there. They're, they do vary. The companies that offer them vary as well. So it's it's a small piece of the talking point, but certainly not a larger piece than that. That's yeah. fascinating. See, there I've just learned something new. I didn't I didn't realize that there were um, there are discounts available for for electric vehicles. So that's something that. Uh, thank you, because we can take that now to our clients and, and mention that. And uh, another selling I, point for you. Yeah, there we go. And and even hybrids uh, actually, Doug, as well. And hybrids oh, really? as well. Okay. So um, I know a few providers specifically um, that do hybrid discounts for anything that's hybrid or electric. And or, or if it's electric, it automatically just gets the hybrid discount too. It's like kind of a one one fits all package still right now Very with neat. some of the providers. But that's great. Oh, you can so always you can always even mention that. There are companies out there that provide further incentives that way. And, and that's, I mean, clients love savings on insurance, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that helps. Ask your broker. There you go. That, that's and, exactly uh, it. Oh, that's a great point because I think it helps. Um, like we were talking about earlier, you know, let's let's lower these, these barriers to entry into the EV world um, because a lot of people are, you know, thinking that because uh, uh, one thing we, we um, you know, a, a challenge that gets posed to us here is the initial price of the vehicle. Yes, it is higher than your standard um, ICE vehicle. Um, and part of that is because of all the raw materials that go into producing an EV. You think of all the, the mining that has to be done, um, all the precious metals that are in there to produce these batteries, whether it's lithium or whatever else it may be, but all the conductive material, all the computer modules to run the technology. So yes, from the cost perspective, oftentimes it initially a little bit higher than, than a comparable unit that is internal combustion. Um, however, uh, you, you, it's, it's a big initial, perhaps, um, uh, upfront investment, but over the lifetime of the vehicle, this is where you, things tend to level out. Um, when it comes to say charging, for instance, you think of what you pay for a tank of gas, the average charge to go from, you know, empty to full, for an electric vehicle, what it would cost you in hydro, you know, off-peak charging overnight, it can be somewhere between five and fifteen dollars at the most. I would say, compare that to what you pay for a tank of gas. Oh boy, there are some big savings there. Um, that over the lifetime of the vehicle, add up, right? Those are tangible dollars. Um, another one is maintenance. You think of all the mechanical parts that are involved in an internal combustion engine, all the you know, uh, par- engine parts, everything. Um, and then oil changes, things like that. With electric vehicles, there's no oil to change. There's no oil, <laughs> you know, There's because it's all in the battery and that's what drives the transmission. So um, from a maintenance perspective, whereas before you'd have to worry about, you know, oil changes and things like that. Um, now you basically just rotate your tires, keep your washer fluid topped up, maybe change your wiper blades every once in a while. And, and that's about it. So that's a big savings of of every time that you're servicing your vehicle um you're not having to pay for those those extra services with an ev um and then you think of repairs too 
yes, you're going to have breaks um, and breaks are a wear item. They will wear down over time as you're using them. Um, but fun fact, they actually wear um, at a slower rate than, than on an ice vehicle. Generally speaking, depends on your habits, but overall, um, because the electric vehicles and, and hybrid vehicles as well use what's called regenerative braking. Um, you guys are likely familiar with this, and it, it just harnesses the kinetic energy of the vehicle slowing down to help charge the battery. And it's not actually applying the brake pads to the rotors that causes the wear. It's just harnessing that energy and slowing the vehicle down. Um, but as a result of that, it doesn't wear the brakes down as quickly. So there's another, um, when you talk about cost of ownership, lifetime, um, some savings that that can be uh, that can be had there. And then, you know, when it comes to insurance claims as well, uh, I guess we'll have to see when more data comes out. But I would think that a lot of the damage uh, would be if, if the vehicle does sustain damage, you're still going to want to make sure you have uh, sufficient coverage just because your maintenance costs are down. You know, there is still a lot of technology in the vehicle. If you need sensors replaced, if you need head, head headlamps are a big thing. Um, if, you know, if the battery is damaged, okay, you're going to want to make sure your coverage is, is adequate. And, and like we said before, you have the right rental coverage too. Um, but maybe if, if, you know, it's, it's important for folks to do the math, see what works for them. But a lot of times it, it ends up being, you know, a net game for some people, especially on the commercial side, um, of the business. A lot of our fleet, fleet customers now are electrifying their fleets or going to hybrid vehicles for that same reason, less maintenance, uh, less fuel costs. Uh, Ford does have the all electric transit van now as well. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. My apologies, but um, that's another uh, member of the Ford family that uh, is all electric um, for delivery vans, contractors, companies that need the utility of a big kind of cube style uh, transit van um, to, to help electrify their, their lineup. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, more than meets the eye. Those are very, very good points. And honestly, I didn't even realize that that's how electric vehicles kind of use the braking system. But again, another massive point for people, if you guys are in the market, um, uh, looking at an electric vehicle, I would definitely say contact Doug at Wayne Pittman Ford Lincoln, because again, those are things that a lot of people don't think of. And when you're making a purchase, a massive purchase like that, that you're probably going to be driving for the next five to 10 years, like you want to make sure you're making the right per- the right decision and not just jumping into it because it, you like the way it looks or it drives nice. You want to make sure you have all the information to make an educated decision based off of what the purchase is going to be. So no, I wanted to kind of wrap it up from there. And again, thanks, Doug, for coming on the podcast. Um, it was okay, very. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I uh, is a really uh, a great honor to be on here with you guys. And uh, hey, who knows down the road if you want to touch base again, I'd be happy to come on anytime. And uh, as always, if you or your clients have questions about vehicles, I'm here to help. There's no uh, obligation or anything. It's always nice to sometimes just get a you know a second opinion or or maybe get some of these insights that uh, aren't always available. Uh, online or, or, or tougher to find sometimes the internet is a wild place so always happy to help however i can and yeah thank you for doing what you guys do i think it's a, a wonderful thing to help people you know kind of break down these barriers i uh, get a look peek behind the curtain of here's what goes on and and uh you know make better informed decisions like you said james you said it perfectly yeah i, pre- I appreciate it doug thanks for joining us today um tons of info from Hopefully some of our viewers and listeners like like yourself as well, but now on the opposite side of things. So it's cool to see that in action. Yeah, it's really neat. And, and uh, we got uh, the best nickname of all time, uh, Mitigation <laughs> Mike. There we out go. Of this yeah. episode. Hey, hey, man, if, if clients can mitigate their risk, they don't need to put in a claim in. I'm happy. They're happy. Everyone wins. It's a win-win. Exactly. Can there you put go, that but... in your email uh, signatures now? Moving, moving <laughs> forward? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if that would be... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, it's a. Hey, we'll table that. We'll table that. Yeah. We'll see if we can get some T-shirts and stuff made. Doug, we'll get there you we one. Go. Yeah, the swag. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll start it up. But no, thanks again, fellas. And uh, yeah, looking forward to connecting again soon. Mike, I hear you like to golf as well. I know James likes to golf. So hey, maybe we uh, we get together over that as well at some point. But uh, yeah, yeah, thanks again for having me on, and keep up the great work. Yes, I would love to. I always keep telling Mike we have to get out because I haven't been out with him yet. So we'll definitely. Usually, hey, hey, I'm I'm a pretty 
there's two things. I am a pretty lazy golfer, so I don't want it to drive far. If you guys ever want to play in Niagara, though, come down this way because that's oh. where I'm at, and there's a, there's a handful no of courses. Of so there's a lot of nice down there. Down there. A lot of beef. I'm happy to make the drive down. That'd be a blast. So thank you very much. If I can yeah. drive, if I can drive 20 minutes or under to a course, that's my go-to. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm spoiled that way, right? I can drive 20 minutes and be able to get 20 courses. You have tons of courses out there, Bingo. so we'll, make we'll definitely happen. we'll set up a date. But yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, this episode will drop on the 17th of January, um, so you'll see that. And then, like I said, if you want to, if you're ever in the Guelph area, make sure you stop by Wayne Pittman Ford and Lincoln talk to Doug, talk to their amazing staff. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys, have a great rest of your day and we'll see you guys next week on the Broker Breakdown.